You know, this is a time when Philip V in Spain builds the royal palace. This is a time of the great courts of Europe. In England, the Hanoverians didn't even speak English, and they lived in a little villa that would be overlooked in Turak or Vaucluse. I mean, come on, they had to beg for funds. They couldn't raise taxes. They couldn't raise an army. It was a tiny little central entity compared with what was happening in the rest of Europe. What England did was to retrieve the individual responsibility that had grown over centuries and that the Stuarts were trying to take away from them for the sake of an enlightened central government that they felt could lead the nation in a better direction. So I would say, first factor sustaining modernity is this different understanding of individual responsibility almost by default. No one that I know when the petition of right or the declaration of right or immediately in the aftermath when William and Mary had to negotiate the act of toleration, for instance, said anything about individual rights. But by pushing the crown into a corner, the baronial periphery retained, in fact, individual rights. Number one. Number two. Thousands of books have been written about the Industrial Revolution. Monographs, articles. To this day, the argument, when did it start? What was it, the main reason, etc. But there are two aspects of it, which in my opinion, have received less attention than they deserve. And one of them is almost a tourist attraction. It's so, such a forceful, robust presence, symbolically correct, that it is a tourist attraction. And it's called Colebrookdale. I'm sure many of you have visited, and the Iron Bridge in Colebrookdale, the Derbys of Colebrookdale, and this morning, uh, I'm sorry, this afternoon, well, today, uh, one of our uh, colleagues, a distinguished speaker, mentioned the date 1709. 1709, when in England, uh, intellectual property patents were first recognized. It happens to be the date when Abraham Darby, for the first time, utilized the coking of coal to smelt iron, you know, and produce uh, cast iron a revolutionary de development. And to do this, when, when he did this, he activated something that is at the very heart of the Industrial Revolution, and it's in, in, a, in a very real way responsible for the, one of the greatest, I would say, the greatest transformation of human society ever. And what is that? Until this time, practically until that time, Human beings, whenever they thought about it, valued permanence, valued the unchanging, the, the, the eternal. Plato perhaps best illustrates that. To solve a problem, he invites us into a cave and tells us that what reality is just the, sh the shadows of the real thing. That we are chained to look into the back of the cave and behind us is a big fire and between the fire and us and us we cannot turn your heads uh, the, the idea of a chair passes through and we see the shadow of the chair against the back of the cave so all reality is impermanent and they're just shadows of reality reality is unchanging and this has been embroidered by other philosophers. Say, how can you have true knowledge of something that tonight is one thing and tomorrow morning is another thing? You cannot have true knowledge. True knowledge can only come from something that does not change. So passivity, immobility, the real thing that does not change is at the heart of society. And their whole philosophy is resting on this. All change is for the worse. We already know what's what. Let's keep it that way. Suddenly, the Darby's of Colebrookdale, putting to work the enabling circumstance 
of a creative individualism or that had not been the result of legislation, no <laughs> one in Westminster knew about this, that had nothing to do with government action, that was very distant from Westminster. This happened in the border country, Shropshire and Wales. It happened at the hands of Quakers who suffered all sorts of disabilities. They had no lobby, no, no party, no voice in Westminster. What happened that they started a discovery, they didn't even realize it, now we realize what they did, that in order to respond to changes in science and technology, any scientific innovation that translates into a technological application may result in this. Any change in taste <coughs> may result in this. What is this? A recombination of the factors of production. You have to move labor from here to there. You have to move uh, land, fi find your resources where you can. You have to move capital. You have to do it all the time. It is impossible to stay still. So change suddenly occupies the heart of human society. For the first time in millennia, it never happened before. And it happened in England, in the border country of Wales, distant from Westminster. The government had nothing to do with it, absolutely nothing to do with it. Third, so it's glorious revolution, industrial revolution. Ah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have human society, humanity, has um, a sense of humor and, and uh, we are very clever. And when we find it difficult to define something that is elusive and complex and almost indefinable, we grab a, a, an, a, an invention that is really a monument to our ingenuity, which uh, Professor Minot made use of a little while ago. It's called a metaphor. Metaphors tell the truth by lying. I say Matthew Richardson is a tiger. Well, he actually plays for, for Richmond, you know, but he's not a tiger, but everyone knows. You see, if I were to say he is like a tiger, it's a simile, that's not, nah, that's not as good. No, I say he is a tiger. Well, he isn't a tiger, but you get the point. I, I say, he says, West is modernity. And we understand that West is a metaphor. It has nothing to do with geographical direction. Well, it's a history to it, but etc. So here is the concept of society, which has puzzled human beings forever. And we have come up with a number of metaphors. And some of them are pretty ingenious. Me uh, those of you who li like opera may remember Janice Kiki. You know, uh, society is a tree. Its roots are in the country. And it draws its nourishment from the country, and it flourishes in Florence, you know, a tree. Uh, if you're a Thomas scholar, to society is an organism. It's an organism. That, by, uh, that one is a very deceptive, a tricky one, no, not the Thomistic one, but the revival of it now. Because it, once you accept that society is an organism, civilization is, an or is, an, is a social phenomenon, then you start thinking in terms of youth, adolescence, maturity, senility, and death. You know, it's, it's an anthropomorphic projection that it may or may not be correct, but you get the idea. But better, society is an organism. You're born man knee, and you work hard as man knee for 30 years, you know, make it 40 years. You never failed. So you start getting ideas. Is I should be promoted. I should be made man eye. I mean, how long am I going to be man knee? I don't see anything. Oh, well, he's wearing trousers. I, where am I going? I would like to be man ear. Well, you must stay man knee. And there are interpretations of society that go along those lines. Society is a mechanism. Economists love this one. You know, you put more weights here, and then it moves that way and that way, and it's a mechanism. Not quite satisfactory and so on and so forth. You probably have examples in your own, from your own experience. But now, for the past 150 years, give or take, we have come to terms with this problem, with one that has not yet 